Happy Valentine's Day to all of you out there. Uh, just a little Valentine's Day information for you. On 269 AD, St. Valentine, or at that point he would have been just Valentine, was imprisoned. And unfortunately that included uh, being beheaded and buried uh, for, listen to this, this is why he did that, because, or would that happen to him? Because he was healing persecuted Christians and he was marrying Christian couples. People that wanted to get married and they wanted a faith-based marriage and they weren't allowed to by other people because of the persecution they're facing, uh, Valentine would marry them. And while in prison, he prayed for his jailer's daughter and uh, she was blind and she regained her sight. And on the day of his execution, he left her a note that was signed, your Valentine. And from there, we have our Valentine's Day cards and the history of where we're at. So maybe, Norm, you need to uh, get a nice card and put it color-coordinated in between the shirts that match that color of card that you have there. But uh, no matter... No matter whether you have a sweetheart to embrace today uh, or whether or not your sweetheart is Jesus, uh, this story goes to tell us that it wasn't really about the romance. It was about a man who was serving God with all that he was and all that he had, giving the love of God to others who needed it. And that's just an amazing way for us to take uh, it's turned into a very commercial holiday and remember its roots, that it really was about loving more like Jesus. I'm excited today to get to uh, preach with my wife, uh, my better half, or uh, my Valentine, Ingrid. Um, one of the things we love to joke around with in our relationship is that uh, I always tell her that she's always my second option. She's always number two in my life. And the reason why I say that is because God has to be number one in my life. And so it's all the time I'll look her deep into the eye and look like I'm going to say something really romantic. And then I say, honey, you're my second option. You're number two in my life. And it's just to remind myself and in our relationship that God has to be number one and that our, our marriage and our relationship has to be centered on Christ in Christ alone. And looking at our centeredness on Christ and Christ alone today, uh, no matter where you're watching from, whether you're in your living room, your bedroom, your kitchen, wherever. Now, here's the thing. Next week, you're going to have to get in a totally different position to come to church because it won't be just virtual. Many of you will be able to register tomorrow and come next week. And so we expect you to not be in your PJs, to not be putting your feet up on the couch and, and everything and relaxing and, and watching that way, but to be here worshiping together with us. If you are comfortable with it, we can't wait to be together. But today we're going to look at two stories that lead us into growing and loving more like Jesus. That's right. Yes, he is also my second option, and I love that he says that about me. <laughs> I would definitely want Jesus to be first, and the two stories that we're looking at today are all about the position that we sit before God in, and I love that his position is that Jesus is first. That's absolutely where I would love for his heart to be. In looking at these two stories, we will see that the position of our hearts before God matters and is actually a huge key, really the key, to loving like Jesus so we are responsible, yes, for the defining moments in our life, those mountaintops and valleys, those things that we remember. But there is a huge lead up to those points in our life. It's not just those defining moments. Boom, all of a sudden we're there and it is what it is. But we make these small decisions leading up to them that, that lead to the victory or the defeat that happens. It's a much earlier thing that, that brings us to that point. So let's take a look at King David's life because we really can see this in his life. He's, a, he's an emotional guy, right? He's so driven by all sorts of things, but he is a man after God's own heart, but he absolutely has some pivotal moments in his life where we see victories and defeats based on a lot of lead up. So let's take a look at this story. In the spring... In the spring of the year, the time when kings go to battle, David sent Joab, his servant with him, and all of Israel, and they ravaged Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at that part. Um, but David remained in Jerusalem. 
This is 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. Now, there's something in that verse that really sticks out. First of all, they're saying in the time when kings go out to battle. So this scripture is saying this is a normal thing. This is an expected thing. And really, because it's in scripture, I think God's expecting this of kings, that they go out to battle, they lead their people, they're with their people. But it says, but David remained in Jerusalem. He didn't, he didn't go with all his people. He sent somebody else off to lead them. And so this is a big issue. There's something wrong here. Kings are supposed to be leading their people. They're supposed to be out there protecting and leading and making decisions, but, but he stayed back. And this is an issue. It doesn't really matter that all these times before David did this. And if you look back in the scriptures, he was very consistent in like going before God and saying, God, you know, do we attack God? How do I handle this? And he, he approached battles in this place of submission before God and bringing the battles before God and bringing his life and leadership before God. But in this instance, he just stayed behind. There's no mention of him going to God and asking God. There's nothing. If God had said, stay back, okay, that's one thing. But he, there's no mention of that. It, does, it seems that he just kind of made this decision for whatever reason. And so this right here shows that he's not really positioning himself already in a place of submission before God in this. He's just doing this. And it seems like a small decision, but it's in small decisions that we start to see a lead up to something actually massive. It's pivotal in his leadership in in his life. So it really doesn't matter that he has done all these things beforehand. He really let his guard down. And in this moment, he has made himself vulnerable He's made himself vulnerable to the enemy. He's made himself vulnerable to his own desires because he's just going with what he feels like doing. And so he's putting himself in a position of just not before God in submission, but rather his own desire. So one of our spirituals, spiritual enemies' greatest advantages over the children of God is his consistency as opposed to our consistency. Dean Sherman says this in his book, Spiritual Warfare for Every Christian. And really this is speaking about the fact that the enemy consistently is looking to bring us away from God. And he just consistently will look for holes and chinks in our armor. And every time we're inconsistent in pushing into God, in submitting ourselves to God, in leaving ourselves before God, in bringing the seemingly sometimes small and insignificant decisions before God, we are leaving room for the enemy to consistently come in and find a hole in our armor. And David did this when he sat here and said, I'm just going to stay here. You guys go. He got out of position, really. Sure, he's still king. He still still holds his kingly position in the natural. But before God, he moved out of position. It's like he came to a fork in the road, and he chose to start stepping on the path of his own desire versus the path of, of uh, approaching God and leading toward God. And it looks small at first, but slowly but surely, those paths really diverge from each other. So David is out of position. And this in and of itself isn't really sinful. Being out of position, it's not like he did some big sin. He's just leaving himself vulnerable. It's unwise. And so as we look at our own lives, it's important that as we make decisions, as we decide to sleep in in the morning instead of our, do our devotions, as we decide to ignore that like poke in our spirit to do something, to call somebody, to go somewhere, to forgive somebody, that those small decisions, they're really unwise. They're leaving us vulnerable for the enemy to come in and build on our own desires to, to draw us away from God. And so these maybe seemingly not really sinful decisions leave us in an unwise position. It's really positioning ourselves in a place of pride. David positioned himself either, it's either arrogance or just, he's, he's just kind of, meh, right? We're either saying, like, I know better God, essentially, or I just feel like doing it this way. And it's kind of apathy toward God. 
And so he's, he's kind of planning himself in a way that's not positioning himself in submission, but rather in his own will. And we often can get out of position, and we don't really see it until we're there, if that makes any sense. So once we're, we don't really realize we're stepping out of position because we're just kind of doing what we do. And I think David may not have really realized how impactful that decision to stay back, that impactful that decision to stay back really would be in his own life. So the next scripture, it says, In 2 Samuel 11, 2-3, it says this, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful, and David sent and inquired about the woman. The one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, this should have been actually a moment where David paused and thought about how he was using his power. Because this servant was like questioning him, going, isn't, isn't this like Uriah's wife that you're going and sending for? I'm sure he knew his intention. <laughs> I'm sure he knew what David was up to. And really, this should have been a moment where he checked and went, oh yeah, probably bad decision. I'm not really making a good one here. But no, he just blew past this, this moment set in front of him and kept going and made another decision in his own will versus the way God would have him. See, Uriah, it's it's believed that Uriah actually was probably pretty close to David, probably one of his, his mighty men that he'd been with for a long time. They were close. He would have known him. It's not like this was somebody far off that, you know, he could kind of put out of his mind. And really, if he was out in the battlefield, he would have never made the decisions he's making because he would have seen this person right in front of him. He would have never put in this precarious position his relationship and and these people that he cares about deeply. But because he was out of position, he saw this thing he wanted, and he just went for it. He just did it. And so David, uh, from this position of doing what he would like, he just used his kingly power for his own pleasure See, we don't see what we sh- uh, we don't see what we should when we're at a position. We only see what we desire. And if I think if we reflect on our own lives, we can see that. How easy is it when we get barreling along in our own life, and really not bringing ourselves on a regular basis before God in submission, not checking with Him? How easy is it to get off course and just start? kind of digging into the things that we want. And before we know it, we're down a path that we really don't want to be down. So as David is looking at this, he should have been out there protecting his people, but instead he's using his power to go after a woman who's already married to a man who is totally devoted to him, who has been with him through thick and thin, and he's he's about to do something awful. So he sleeps with Bathsheba, And she becomes pregnant, which puts them both in a precarious position. You know, as king, he probably could have gotten away with it because of his position. You know, it may have looked very bad on him, but he probably would have gotten away with it. But he didn't want anybody to know, and so he starts manipulating Uriah. He brings him back from the battlefield and asks him about the battle. And so like, go, you know, sleep with your wife. It's okay to try and cover up. He tries to cover up his sin. You know, and in the end, Uriah doesn't go for it because he's so devoted, because he's an upright man. He wants to lead his life in a way that is honorable. And really, in a position of submission before God, he is being the ultimate example of how David should be living. So in the end, David actually has him killed out on the battlefield. The very place where he should be protecting him, he sends him out and has him killed and uses his position of authority and power, instead of to care for these people, he ends up hurting them all. And actually, many more people were hurt from this because he didn't position himself in front of God in a place of submission. And so David is responsible for all these decisions, the small ones starting right to these big, massive decisions he's making. Um, And yet, the pain of what is what is, was preceded by the failure to pay attention to his position. 
the pain of what he's suffering now, right? All the bad decisions he's made and all the pain that everybody else is feeling was preceded by all these small decisions to move out of position from under God's authority into just going after his own desires. Well, in this, uh, David thinks he's covered his tracks by having Uriah taken care of. But God has seen it all, and he sends a prophet to him and calls him out and says, you know, you can't stay like this. This is terrible. And so basically, at the end of the day, um, he's exposed. And it says here, in Numbers 32, 23, it says, You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now, this is not really meant as like a threatening statement and like God's here to bash you, but really from a place of love and affection. It's like tough, strong love. This conviction is meant to bring David back into proper position with God. It's to pull him from this spiral of like desire back into position before God where he's in humility and serving him. And you know, humanity, we always get ourselves out of position, don't we? We all have a position. We may not be kings, but we all need to stay in proper position before God in humility, in allowing him to speak to us, in order for us to lead loving lives. That whole scenario, there was nothing loving in that that David lived out. Nothing loving. It was completely self-serving. Even in trying to fix things, maybe even if he's trying to consider Bathsheba and the consequences she would have suffered for being pregnant with another man, nonetheless, it was purely self-serving in what he did. And he was out of position. And how many times do we get ourselves in these places where we realize that we're we're not in the right place, and it's all self-serving, and we have to come back. So thank God for his conviction that he can bring us back into these places. And this is a repeating story all through, from the Garden of Eden right to now. You can see it in our personal lives. You can see it in every life in the Bible of this place of God desiring us to eat from the fruit of life, right? He's like, here, I have the best things for you. I have life for you. Just follow me. I have what you need. But instead, we believe that we can handle it better. We can handle it differently, that we know what it is. Whether it's good intentions or not really doesn't matter. It could be about justice or about how we see things need to go. But if we're not positioning ourselves before God, it's really out of order, it's really going to take us down a path that does not lead to life or loving as Jesus does. So you don't have to be a king on a rooftop to behave like you are the king of your own heart. And really, ultimately, that's what David was, was living like. And that's how we often live if we're getting out of position with God. Being out of position doesn't mean we do what David did at all. It may not be stealing somebody's wife. It just looks like us, from our position alone, defining for ourselves what good and what evil is. That is so good, Pastor Ingrid. How many times do we do that, where we just redefine what good and evil really is? Instead of leaving it in God's hands to do so, we ourselves, we weigh it and go like, this is okay, this isn't okay, and we redefine it. We justify it. We find ways to do what, uh, what David did, was in his position of power, he sought pleasure instead of God's purpose for his life. Now, you may be thinking, what power do I have? But you do have power over your life and your choices. And anytime you use that power for pleasure instead of God's purposes, you knock yourself out of alignment with what God has in store for you. So how do we deal with this? How do we look at this and find uh, the Jesus way to move forward? How do we find a way to love more like Jesus, to find ourselves in positions to really move forward with Jesus? And there's a story regarding Jesus where all his disciples think that he is out of position, where he's not in the right place. Like, like David, he should have been in one place, but instead he's in another place, and they think this is going to be trouble for him. So let's look at that story and see whether or not David and Jesus are in the same type of out of position moment or if there's something we can learn here. And this is from John chapter 4 verse 5 and 8. 
And he says, it says this, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour, which would be about noon for us. Uh, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now here's what we notice in this situation. This potentially out of position situation. Jesus was alone at the well. It was noon. All right. A Samaritan woman comes to the well. And here's what we do know. Right. In this, in this cultural setting, women would often go to the well in a group. This was a part of their both social time. This was a part of their like regular pattern to go to the well to get water for the day's use. They would go together because it would offer them both uh, uh, community and safety of traveling in numbers, not having to go to a place like the well that was out of the city or on the edge of the city alone. We also know that men didn't usually talk to women in this type of setting, especially a setting where Jesus, being Jewish from Israel, and, and uh, the woman being Samaritan, uh, their relationship between those two groups of people was not great. They did not, uh, they did not honor each other and look well upon each other. The Jews would often look down on Samaritans, uh, or people from Samaria at the time. And so there was, not, there was not really any reason for Jesus to be talking to her. All right, and we see this when we drop down to verse 27 in this account. We see how the disciples again would see it as being out of position. It says in verse 27, Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. Right there we see that they did not expect him to be doing so. But no one asked, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? While they thought maybe she was out of position, uh, unlike the account of David where when David inquired about Bathsheba and somebody said, um, isn't that a married woman? Isn't that a married woman of a guy who's in your army? Should we, shouldn't we just pause here? They didn't even say anything. They didn't question Jesus. They were just all probably timid watching back going like, I can't believe he's talking to a woman at the well alone. We leave this guy alone for five minutes and here he is, you know, getting out of position. I don't know what was going through their minds, but they didn't bring anything up. Now, here's the thing. Jesus might have been out of a cultural position, right, where culture dictated the, the scenario there that you couldn't talk to a woman. You couldn't, uh, women shouldn't be going to uh, the well alone. Now, here's the thing, right? Those cultural reasons for what was happening would we look at them and say there are godly cultural reasons that they were in that position? That men shouldn't talk to women. Do we really see that as a God-ordained thing? Probably not. We wouldn't see that as the equality of men and women, as, as men and women and the women being the helpmate, the co-worker, alongside of men, that that would be the relationship that God was anticipating. Or the fact that she was there alone. Obviously that meant something. If women usually travel to the well in, in, in groups together for community and she was alone, then she didn't have community. She was, she was ostracized from her community for some reason. Because there she was in the middle of the day at the worst time to go to get water. She was out seeking water from the well instead of being there when most of the women would have gone. So he may have been out of a cultural position sitting there, Jesus, but he is in an absolute divine position to help, to be something that she absolutely needs in that moment. And Jesus, in this situation, is our better David. He handled things completely differently than David did. Watch how he treats her. Jesus treats a woman who also happened to be a Samaritan. He treats her with dignity, with grace, and with truth. He uses his position to unlock her grander purpose. Think of that. He uses his position to unlock her grander purpose. How beautiful is that? And together they have this conversation about water. And Jesus speaks to this genuine thirst that she has. She's there for literally 
water and they have this conversation and they go back and forth describing uh, what, they're, what they're there for and what they need. And before her grander purpose can be revealed though, there must be this grace and truth conversation. There must be this moment where Jesus can reveal the grace and truth that he has and who he is and why he can offer her something different, this grander purpose in her life. How can he offer her that unless he has this grace and truth conversation? He says this in John chapter 4, 16 to 26. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, you can see that while she may be Samaritan uh, and from Samaria and not Jewish and not fully maybe understanding all of the Jewish uh, cultures and practices and faith, you can see that there is something searching inside of her. Because she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem, it is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who you speak to uh, am he. Can you see the grand love of God in this conversation? Can you see the heart of the glorious gospel in that? Well, something so amazing that I see in this uh, passage is that Jesus admits that he is the Messiah. And if you read through the New Testament, if you've read through any of the four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you'll realize quickly that Jesus does not disclose who he is very often. In fact, he goes to great lengths to, to cover it up until the right time. He asks people not to share that he is the Christ, the, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God. He tells them to keep it quiet until the appointed time. And yet in this scenario, this moment where he's supposedly out of cultural position, he reveals that he is the Messiah. To a woman no less, at a well where they shouldn't have been talking. Jesus dismisses the cultural position of what they thought the Messiah should be. Because at that time, if he had revealed himself as the Messiah to, to the Jewish people, they would have been looking for a king who would exert power on a, on a human throne, on a human kingdom over human enemies. And that is not the Messiah that Jesus came to be. And somehow, this Samaritan woman perceived that. That what she was looking for and the Messiah she knew she should, she should worship wasn't just this geographical king. It was a king over her heart and life. That is absolutely amazing. That Jesus would reveal himself and meet her where she was. Jesus loves her just the way she is with her broken past relationships and broken current relationship. And not just her, her romantic relationships, but the relationships she had with the people around her and that she was in the position she was in. He loves her just the way she is, and yet he loves her enough not to leave her the way she is. Now listen to her own words as she is transformed uh, by who Jesus is and who Jesus has come to mean to her. It says this in, in John uh, 4, 28 to 30. It says, The woman left her jar, 
her water jar, and went away into the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Then they went out of the town and were coming to him. I love how scripture words that, that passage. I love the intentionality of, of what God has kind of conveyed through the inspired word there. The woman left her water jar. The only reason why she came out to the well was to get water. She was there in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, the worst time to go and walk and have to carry a heavy jar of water. And the only reason she went was to get the water. And what does she leave behind and go back to town without her water jar, the very thing she came to seek. And why? Because she found a water source that was so much deeper and more fulfilling than the water from that well. She is an encounter with Jesus, the living water, the water that would allow her to never thirst again. What have you been looking for elsewhere that God has for you that would cause you to abandon your pursuit of whatever it is and take Jesus? What is it that your heart is longing for and looking for that you've come and you're searching for and when you come into contact with Jesus, you will forget all about it because of who he is to you in that moment. Next, we see her engaging her grander purpose. For the first time in her life, she has met a man who told her all that she had ever done. Remember, like the five husbands, the one she's living with isn't even her husband. And here it is. He knew all this stuff about her, and yet he forgave her, he accepted her, and he loved her. He forgave her, he accepted her, and he loved her. The Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one she was looking for to worship, In a string of broken relationships with men, she finds a man who sees her for her value, accepts her, loves her, and and cares for her. Jesus gives her eternal life. And he gives her earthly purpose by rightly handling good, evil, grace, and truth. Remember, uh, Pastor Ingrid was saying how, like David, we, we choose to try and, and figure out how to handle and how to define good and evil, right and wrong, and do things in our own way. Jesus knows how to handle good and evil, grace and truth. Jesus knows everything about us, and he still loves us, accepts us, and forgives us. Now, Watch what happens as we keep going in chapter, uh, verse 39 to 42. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, because of that purpose that Jesus gave her. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Isn't that amazing? Her grander purpose led them to having their own moments with Jesus. It may not have been at a well, but there was definitely moments where they received that same living water, that same grace and truth, acceptance, forgiveness, and love that she had met in Jesus, they met as well. Now here's a challenge. Here's a challenge for me. Maybe you're in the, you're in the same place. Maybe you struggle with who to identify with in these accounts. Who did you see yourself in that role in, 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 as we've talked this morning? What position did you find yourself in? Did you see yourself as David? Did you see yourself as David as the king who is, who's gotten, he's done everything. He's a man after God's own heart. He's consistently pursued God and done what God asked of him to do. And yet in that moment, he decided to, to weigh his options and figure out, you know what? I've done pretty good. I think I can sit this one out. Do you find yourself in that position? Did you identify with David in that scenario? Maybe you identified with Bathsheba. Things have happened in your life that that was the character in that story that you identified with. 
Maybe somebody we didn't directly mention, but maybe you see yourself as Nathan, the prophet that came and exposed David as a person who's going to bring grace and truth out in people's lives. Did you see yourself as the woman at the well? Broken life, uh, not being able to handle relationships because of a past that, that, is, that is consistently showing up in front of you that you can't seem to run away from. Maybe you see yourself as the disciples who are sitting there going, I don't, I, we don't even know what's going on and, and we don't know how to handle this. It seems so out of position, out of what we have been culturally uh, like made to understand this is right or wrong. We, we don't know what to do in this moment. Did you see yourself as Jesus in that scenario where you're coming to bring grace and truth to others? Or maybe the Samaritans who are intrigued by this woman's transformation and then were transformed by God. Too often for me in these stories, I choose Nathan and I choose Jesus to be the characters that I identify with. That somehow, as a follower of Jesus already, now I am the giver of grace and truth with Jesus in a way. And, and I, I put myself in the story in that position. And I see my cultural mindset, our North American cultural mindset that says, be the hero, be the one that goes out and makes change and brings change and does good, save the earth from pollution and from bad education and whatever. We have this mentality in our, our culture, maybe a little bit more like the disciples, where this is the way we're supposed to work on things. And this is our role to go out and be this. And yet it is Jesus that's the hero. It's Jesus the one that can handle that truth and grace, good and evil, who can offer that forgiveness, who can offer that that. Uh, that acceptance and bring that transformation and be that living water. I can't do that. I can't do it. I need to adjust my position so I can clearly move forward with him. So maybe like David, are you out of position, putting yourself and others in a precarious place, being where you're not supposed to be at a time when you're not supposed to be there? Maybe like David, there's, there's something you need to confess before you are caught. David was given opportunity to confess, given opportunity to repent, and yet he chose not to. When Nathan came and he laid out a, a scenario of, of what, it, what it could look like for somebody to do something that unrighteous and that uh, against God's will, David was quite angry and saying, this guy needs to be punished for doing that. And then Nathan revealed... I said, David, King David, it's you. You're the one doing this. He had opportunity. Even with that first servant who said, that's somebody else's wife. You should back off there. He had opportunity. Maybe you find yourself in a place where you need to confess before you're caught. Like the Samaritan woman, where do you need God's word to speak both grace and truth to you? Where do you need that gentleness of Jesus to come and offer you that acceptance and that forgiveness right where you are while still addressing the truth that needs to be uh, brought forward in your relationship with him? Maybe like the Samaritan woman, do you need your position in Christ to unlock a grander purpose? Maybe you see yourself in a way that doesn't, you think you're disqualified for a grander purpose that God has because of what you've gone through, because of the way your life has unfolded. But maybe, but maybe today you need to see that God has living water for you that transforms who you are for a grander purpose so that you can, like she did, go back to the city and tell others about who Jesus is. Maybe like the disciples, you are caught off guard by the position Jesus wants to take with people. Maybe uh, how you, you view the role that we're supposed to play in our culture as, as followers of Jesus, you're caught off guard when Jesus seems to go into the, into the alleys and into the dark places to meet people that we're not supposed to culturally meet with, and yet he's there to offer grace and truth and love, forgiveness. Maybe you're put off by that. To be loved wholly by Jesus, we need to embrace both grace and truth that are found in Christ. 
We need to humble ourselves and see ourselves in these stories, not as David or, I mean, not as Jesus or as Nathan, the ones that expose truth and grace and bring that, but we need to see ourselves on the receiving end of that. And to love others like Jesus, we need to pay attention to our position, not just our actions. Pay attention to the position of our heart, where we align ourselves and how we're, we're setting ourselves up, that we don't get caught, that we don't allow inconsistency to be where the enemy traps us and catches us. See, the world needs way more stories like the woman at the well where Jesus brings life, living water, and transformation. We need way more stories like that and less stories like an out-of-position king on a rooftop. So where do we go from here? Let me give you four things to just walk through as we, as we decide and, and try to put ourselves in a right position with God. First one, confess before you are caught. Confess before you are caught. Make question and confession a regular position in life. That there's people who can come to you and say, how are you doing? And you're open and honest before them. That you're open and honest before God with where your heart is at. And that you are regularly confessing both to God and somebody else where you're at. What's going good, what's going bad, so that you can live in humility before God and others. Confess before you are caught. Number two, let the, the truth be your truth. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. So let the truth be your truth. Let Jesus define what is good and evil in your life and for your life. Resist the urge, like, uh, like going way back to the Garden of Eden, to grab hold of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the deciding of what is good and what is bad. Resist that fruit that's hanging there, tempting us to take it into our own hands. And instead, let the truth, Jesus, be our definer of good and evil. Number three, live in love. Live in love. Let the love of Jesus continually lead you. If we don't allow his love, if we don't receive his love and continually be in a place where we can receive that love from him, where we can be receiving that living water from him, then he can't lead us. And we find ourselves again out of position. Number four, meet the needs of others with meekness. Meet the needs of others with meekness. See, we don't give grace and truth as benevolence. Too often, as churches and as followers of Jesus, we kind of see that as, as a part of our mission. That because of who God is and what he's given us, then we give. And we, we, we give out of the abundance of God's heart. And I know it sounds, it sounds right. But instead, what God is looking for isn't for us who have received to be these benevolent benefactors to people who don't. Because that creates, again, that power imbalance. That sets us up, as, again, as kings on the rooftop who look down on others and decide whether we're helping or not helping, doing good or doing bad. Instead, Jesus asks us to give with a brotherly love. And if it's our brother or our sister, we don't give out of benevolence. We give because they're family. We give because we're equal. We give because we have and they don't. That's the end of the story. And we also know that we're going to be on the receiving side of that. We don't give because we think we have it all. We think because we give because we know we need just as much as they do. And when we live on that level playing field with others, giving grace and truth and love to others because we know how much we need it ourselves, we can give to others with that meekness, with that gentleness and humility. So confess before you're caught. Let the truth be your truth. Live in love and meet the needs of others with meekness. And then we'll see that, that love of Jesus growing in us to help us be more like him. Let's pray today. God, we just thank you. We thank you so much for how you love us. We thank you, God, that you see us just the way we are. 
in our brokenness, in our frailty, in our pride, in our thinking that we can, we can figure it out on our own and we can do things our way. When we decide to judge good and evil, right and wrong, and, and pick for ourselves which way to go instead of relying on you, God, you see us in that place and you still love us. And God, today you're offering us grace and truth together. You're offering us through your position, a divine position that you have for us, God. You're offering us a grander purpose in you. A grander place to be with you in your love. So God, as individuals, we pray that we would be able to receive your love for what it is. In grace and truth, see us for who we really are. And then in turn, in living in that love, offer that same love to others, God. We want to do that both individually and corporately as a church. We want to live in your love and let your love shine through us. God, may we find our position in you alone. May you convict us and bring us to confession of where we are unaligned with your spirit and your ways. And God, may we truly embrace who you are and drink of the living water that you offer us. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.